number 76, Xinye Road, Shanghai, a historic building of global significance. Here, 100 years ago, a remarkable gathering took place, the first ever National Congress of the Communist Party of China. October 31st, 2017, a week after the CPC's 19th National Congress, General Secretary Xi Jinping and the Standing Committee of the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee arrive in Shanghai to pay homage to the site that witnessed the birth of the Communist Party of China as a political force. The sound of these oaths being resolutely reaffirmed touches the hearts of everyone present. In 1840, Britain, a European capitalist power eager to expand overseas, launched the Opium War against China. British forces sailed across the oceans with just a few thousand soldiers and invaded China. Fighting northward along the Chinese coastlines, they finally defeated the forces of the Qing, the imperial dynasty that ruled China at that time. After the Opium War, the Western powers coerced China into signing hundreds of unequal treaties. Corrupt and incompetent, the Qing government became little more than a tool in the hands of the foreign powers dominating China. In 1901, the Qing authorities were forced to sign another unequal treaty, the Boxer Protocol. It compelled China to pay a massive indemnity to foreign imperialist powers that had invaded China the year before. A sum of this magnitude had never before been demanded in China's modern history. The terms of the Boxer Protocol added insult to injury. As well as paying 450 million taels of silver and annual interest payments, China was also forced to surrender control over the so-called legation quarter. This became an exclusive zone for foreign diplomats and other representatives of foreign interests. Now, there was a foreign enclave exempt from Chinese law right outside the Imperial Palace. The Boxer Protocol marked a new low. China had now sunk to both semi-feudal and semi-colonial status. In 1904, a young man called Chun Du Xiu published a poem lamenting the state of the country in his own newspaper. Bear witness to the end of an ancient nation and the suffering of 400 million compatriots. Blessed are those who can care for nothing but themselves. Painful is the lot of he who cares for the nation. But Chinese people did not meekly sit back as the country went to rack and ruin. They resisted and sought for solutions to the country's plight. 
from the Taiping Rebellion of the mid-19th century to the Hundred Days Reform of the 1890s to the Boxer Rebellion of 1900, countless Chinese people struggled to save the nation and its people. In October 1911, this struggle reached a pivotal moment. The Xinhai Revolution overthrew the Qing dynasty. At a stroke, over 2,000 years of autocratic monarchy came to an end. More significantly, however, the abolition of China's age-old imperial system had the effect of opening up new intellectual and ideological vistas to the Chinese people. This, in the long run, removed barriers to the nation's development and liberated its potential. But the reality was that the 1911 revolution was not enough on its own to rescue China from the parlous state in which it found itself. Emperor or no emperor, the country remained a semi-colonial, semi-feudal society. For that reason, the various political forces that emerged in the immediate wake of the revolution were all destined to fail. Pain and humiliation would remain the lot of the Chinese people. But there were signs of hope. In September 1915, Chen Duxiu started a publication called Youth in Shanghai. Renamed La Jeunesse, meaning New Youth from the second issue, the journal rejected China's feudal culture, instead seeking solutions to China's problems in modern science and democracy. Chen was soon joined by a young man called Li Da Jiao, who published an article in New Youth. This piece was fittingly entitled Youth. <laughs> In 1917, Tsai Yuanpei, then president of Peking University, appointed Chen Duxiu dean of the university's School of Liberal Arts. When Chen relocated to Beijing, so too did New Youth's editorial office. In January 1918, Li Dajiao became director of Peking University's library, followed a little later by Mao Zedong, a founder of the Xinmin Society in Hunan province. Three men destined to alter the course of Chinese history, all in one place. Thus, Chen Duxiu's journal began its close connection with Peking University, with regular contributions from rising literary star Lu Xun, as well as Li Da Jiao, New Youth and Peking University more generally played the central role in the emerging new culture movement. But the new culture movement's emphasis on bourgeois democratic solutions was problematic. Firstly, the First World War had revealed the contradictions inherent in the capitalist system in the starkest terms possible. Secondly, the repeated failure of attempts to reshape China along Western lines had made the Chinese intelligentsia increasingly skeptical about reforming China as a capitalist republic. So the success of the Russian Revolution of October 1917 introduced an ideological alternative, Marxism, that with its stress on anti-imperialism had special appeal in a China still at the mercy of the capitalist and imperialist powers. Thus, Chinese intellectuals began to move away from Western-inspired ideas and pay more attention to socialism. Were the answers to China's problems waiting to be found in the Marxism that had guided the Russian Revolution? In fact, Li Dajiao himself was the first person to raise the communist banner in China in the wake of the October Revolution. Starting in July 1918, he published a series of articles on the October Revolution, like a comparative view of the French and Russian revolutions, the victory of Bolshevism and the victory of the Plebeian, in which he hailed the world's first communist state as the revolutionary pioneer of the 20th century world, whose foundation heralded 
a new dawn for all humanity. He even predicted that one day the communist banner would fly over the whole world. The tilt away from the Western-inspired bourgeois political solutions intensified in 1919. Gathered together in Paris to negotiate the treaties that would formally end World War I, the Allies rejected China's reasonable request to end Germany's privileges in Shandong, proposing to transfer them to Japan instead. Under pressure from world powers, China's representatives were on the verge of signing the treaty. But when news of this latest treaty humiliation broke, the pent-up rage of the Chinese people erupted like a volcano. more than 3,000 Beijing students broke through lines of military police and marched on Tiananmen Square, denouncing the terms of the Paris Peace Conference. A nationwide patriotic movement was born, the May 4th Movement. The May 4th movement also marked the emergence of the Chinese working class as an independent political force. The Chinese working class, the proletariat of a semi-colonial and semi-feudal society, mostly comprised of destitute peasants and artisans. Prior to the May 4th movement, there were about 2 million industrial workers in China, laboring in conditions of unimaginable hardship and poverty. For them, extremely long hours, low wages and poor working conditions were the norm. On June 5, 1919, a month after the student protests began, Shanghai workers spontaneously came out on strike in support of the students. Within days, the number of strikers reached about 70,000. Workers in Beijing, Tangshan, Hankou, Nanjing, Changsha and other cities followed suit. In many cities, merchants and business owners also took action in support of the movement, paralyzing the economy. Before long, the demonstrations had spread to over 100 cities in more than 20 provinces and regions. Faced with popular pressure and discontent at home, on June 28th, the Chinese delegation declined to sign the Treaty of Versailles. In short, the May 4th movement gave progressive forces in Chinese society a boost. In particular, Marxism became more widely known especially in the working class movement. Thus, the May 4th movement can be seen to pave the way for the establishment of the Communist Party of China. Further impetus was provided by Li Da Zhao, who both edited a special issue of New Youth devoted to Marxist studies and helped Beijing's morning news supplement create a Marxist studies column. Meanwhile, Chen Duxiao, the ideological leader of the new culture movement, had also begun to take a Marxist stand. After Li Da Zhao, 
到天津准备南下的时候，在路上呢，他们就商议了，就是计划组织共产党。In March 1920, guided by Li Dajiao, Peking University student Deng Zhongxia and 18 other people secretly formed the Peking University Marxist Study Group, the very first Marxist study group in China. The group called their library. The communism study. This was the first significant collection of Marxist literature in China. To this day, the Peking University Library possesses eight books bearing the communism study seal. 1920, Chun Duxiu proposed the establishment of another Marxist study group in Shanghai. Yu Xiaosong, Chen Wangdao, Li Da, Li Hanjun, and others soon joined the Shanghai Marxist study group. In April 1920, Grigory Voitinsky, a Bolshevik Comintern representative. Met with Li Da Zhao and Chun Du Xiao in Beijing and Shanghai, respectively. This exchange provided Li and Chun with a more concrete understanding of the Russian Revolution. In correspondence, the issue of the establishment of a Chinese Communist Party was raised. By August 1920, the first practical step had been taken. A Communist Party organization had been established in Shanghai, with Chen as secretary. From then on, the editorial office of New Youth had another role: to lay the organizational foundations of the CPC. Funshui Tang Village in Yiwu. Zhejiang, the hometown of Chun Wangdao. In February 1920, Chun Wangdao secretly returned here with a mission to translate the Communist Manifesto. Deng has said that to translate the Communist Manifesto into other languages is extremely difficult. My father was a high language learner. He thought that the Chinese could understand it. 如果不识字的，你读给他听，他听得懂吗？在这样情况下，他就花了大概是比平时多五倍的这个功夫，才把它翻译完成。In August 1920, the Chinese version of the full Communist Manifesto was published, a milestone in the history of Marxism in China. In October, Li Dajiao established a Communist Party organization in Beijing. In November, it formally became the Beijing branch of the Communist Party, with Li as its secretary. When this Chen Duxiu was in Shanghai building the Communist Party, he didn't have a name for the Communist Party. He didn't have a name for it. He wrote a letter to Li Dajiao to confirm his opinion. Li Dajiao said, Chen Duxiu was in Shanghai building the Communist Party, with Li as its secretary. 这个党应该叫共产党，这才是第三国际的意思。On November the 7th, 1920, the Shanghai Communist Party organization launched a monthly publication called The Communist. The banner of the Communist Party had been raised in China. Rue Raymond Tellier, Montagy, France. Is a quaint three-story building. A century ago, it was the residence of Tsai Hsien and other Chinese students taking part in the diligent work frugal study program. During his stay in France, Tsai Hsien corresponded with Mao Zedong on two occasions, systematically articulating his understanding of the basic tenets of Marxism and proposing the formal establishment of a Chinese Communist Party. Mao's response was enthusiastic, excellent views, 
I could not agree with you more, he replied. Facilitated by the newly founded party organizations in Shanghai and Beijing, other communist entities emerged in cities such as Changsha, Wuhan, Guangzhou, and Jinan. Following suit, Chinese intellectuals and students in Japan and France formed similar organizations. My father is from. 八月份去了长沙之后，哎，就是，就是二一年，就是二零年去的，然后就是参加了学会，就在新民协会的同时呢，呃，就各地已经开始建立共产主义者小组，呃，听说当时，呃，湖南的小组是发展了五个党员，呃，那时候我父亲还不是党员，我们学校的老师啊，都是第一师范来的，都是毛泽东的同学。都是共产党员，开会的时候就说，共产党宣言，哎、呃，共产主义 A B C， 那都是自己把谣言演起出来的，那演得很差的，但是非常神圣。Now the stage was set for the first National Congress of the CPC. This convened in July 1921 at 106 Rue Vance in Shanghai's French Concession. Today's number 76, Xingye Road. Participants included Li Da and Li Hanjun from Shanghai, Zhang Guotao and Liu Renjing from Beijing, Mao Zedong and He Shu Hang from Changsha, Dong Bi Wu and Chun Tan Chiu from Wuhan, Wang Jingmei and Dong Enning from Jinan, Chun Rongbo from Guangzhou, Zhou Fohai who returned from Japan, and Bao Hui Song sent by Chen Duxiu. They represented over 50 party members nationwide. Marin and Nikolsky, the Comintern representatives, were also present. Chun Duxiu and Li Da Zhao didn't attend due to their busy schedules. So as to avoid infiltration by secret agents and French concession police force raids, the venue for the last day of the conference was a boat on Nanhu Lake in Jiaxing, Zhejiang. During this first National Congress, several important decisions were made. Principally, the guiding principles of the CPC were outlined, with Communist Party of China confirmed as the party's name, and Socialism and Communism specified as its goals, to be achieved by means of revolution. Furthermore, the Congress also set up a central bureau, this gave the party an interim leadership structure, with Chen Duxiu elected as secretary. At last, a nationwide Communist Party organization had come into existence in China. In the decades that followed the Congress, some of the delegates like Mao Zedong and Dong Bi Wu went on to become senior party leaders. Others died heroically in the years of struggle that ensued. Some fell by the wayside. A few, such as Zhang Guotao, Chen Gongbo, and Zhou Fohai, betrayed the cause of the party and nation. Great waves wash away the sand. It's precisely this process of continual renewal that has enabled the party to go from strength to strength. Xiu 如今已经发展成为拥有八千九百多万名党员的世界第一大党。只有不忘初心，牢记使命，永远奋斗，才能让中国共产党永远年轻。
the founding of the Communist Party of China marked the beginning of a revolutionary new chapter in the history of the Chinese nation. It was a historical inevitability, called into being by the people. As the party of the most progressive class in China, the working class, the CPC represents not only the interests of the working class, but also the interests of the entire Chinese people and Chinese nation. The birth of the Communist Party in China would bring about the fulfillment of the Chinese Revolution. Thank you. 